an almost incomprehensibly vast universe. For most of the last decade, I worked on a project, along with a large team of astronomers, a project to map the universe. The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was an attempt to image the sky. It imaged about 20% of the sky using this telescope in New Mexico, and it detected about 200 million galaxies. And for the brightest million of them, we took spectroscopy and actually was able, were able to determine accurate distances. What resulted was a three-dimensional map of our universe. So let's look at that map in the sky, and if I zoom in to the main region of the survey, and now I'm color-coding objects based on their distance from us, you begin to see this pattern, this filamentary network of structure, something we're now calling the cosmic web. So this is what our universe looks like on the grandest of scales. Now, this is my office. I uh, work at the Adler Planetarium and Astronomy Museum in Chicago, and this is something we call the Space Visualization Laboratory. And it's a place where we try to make innovations and discoveries, like the one I just talked about, accessible to the general public. And we do that through imaging. So if we're going to talk about something like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we'll try to do a number of things. We'll try to place it in context. So we start out at the Earth. We'll fly away from the Earth. Look a little bit. There goes the moon. Um, and as we head out of our solar system, we get, begin to get a sense of scale of you know, the immense distance between stars, the immense number of stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. And eventually, and it'll take a while because we've got a long way to go, eventually we'll fly out far enough to see the large-scale structure of the universe. And here we start to see more and more galaxies coming to view. And the patterns, well, not quite yet. Now, now we're just heading out of the Milky Way. But as we, as we pull out, we'll see the galaxies come to view, and we'll see that that structure of the universe, clusters of galaxies and superclusters of galaxies. So uh, this, is, this is the forefront of our knowledge about the structure of our universe. And it's kind of interesting. We've made this new map, this new map. And not a lot of people know what the universe looks like. We spent a lot of money, a lot of time, decades of research to, to find out. So here, this is your universe. We're now traveling through it rather quickly. Something like a million light years per second. Oh, sorry. Apologies to Einstein. <laughs> There's a cluster of galaxies you zoomed in on. So let's take, take a time and just uh, appreciate the beauty of this. So one of, one of the things that's really rewarding in my job uh, in a public institution is I get the opportunity to present discoveries like these to the general public. And one particularly rewarding experience I had was flying uh, a group of bishops, Lutheran bishops, through the universe. And it's a little scary, actually, to lecture them about the origin of the universe. Um, but afterwards, I got this great letter. And uh, this, this one comment really struck me. And it was, uh, my theology began to experience growing pains. Right? So it's, we, we live in this world, and it's a, it's a very dangerous place, but as we push our frontiers of scientific knowledge outwards, that boundary between science and religion becomes a very interesting place. Scary place, but an interesting place. Um, but everybody's afraid to go there. And that's understandable, because last time we did, it didn't turn out so well. So <laughs> probably, probably, you know, the, the, when humanity really faced this, it was with the uh, geocentric revolution, the Copernican revolution. And science didn't fare so well there, and, and, and for a number of reasons. One, it took us out of our special place in the universe. So people, it's not as rewarded a place. Um, you know, if I look at what we know about the universe now, the universe is cold. It's, uh, on average, it's, it's uh, under three degrees Kelvin. Very cold. Colder than Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> the universe is empty. If I took an average volume uh, of the universe the size of this auditorium, there would only be something like 100 hydrogen atoms, right? So incredibly empty. But 
we live in a very special place. So our, the place we live in the universe is still very special. We have places like this, right? It's not like the average region of the universe. Now, the universe is also big. And this is the part that scares a lot of people. But just because the universe is big, that doesn't mean that we are insignificant. In fact, in many ways, because the universe is so big, and because we've been able to figure out so much about it, we really are, you know, we can feel pretty good about ourselves. This is really probably humanity's greatest achievement. So, uh, this is an amazing simulation. So, for a long time, we've actually been able to use the physics that we know and run supercomputer simulations to actually reproduce the entire evolution of the universe and produce structures that look like what we see when we've mapped out the structure of galaxies. This one goes a step further. What it actually has done is not just reproduce things that look like our galaxy, it's actually our universe. It's reproduced our, our local universe. So in it, we'll see that's where we live. That's our local group. You know, that's the Virgo cluster, the nearest nearby large cluster of galaxies, about 50 million light years away. So we're able to actually reproduce those random fluctuations that led to the, the development of our universe. Now, all this, you know, we start thinking about, well, these modern theories of the universe should affect the way I think about myself and my place in the universe. Let's go to the next question. There are lots of crazy theories out there, right? You hear from me about things in the New York Times. So if you say to me, hey, Mark, how seriously should I take this new theory I just read about in Science Times? I'll make an equation for you. So, so this is an equation that lets you know how much you should worry about a new idea. And the first uh, factor is W, it's, it's, it's a weight. And that's just, you can pick that. That's what kind of person you are. Are you somebody who worries about everything? Then you can pick a big number. If you don't worry about, the, if you take everything easy, you know, it's a low number. The next one is the probability that that theory is correct, right? So I might worry that I'll be impaled by a unicorn, but there aren't a lot of unicorns running around, so I don't really have to concern myself with that. And the last one is, you know, how earth-shattering is it? You know, how big an impact should it, does this new theory have on my worldview? How different is it than the way that I think about the universe? So, here's an interesting one. Um, the idea of an infinite universe. So we'll do now is examine some of these theories. Now, we don't know if the universe is infinite or not, but it might very well be. And that has some... Uh, really amazing philosophical consequences. Now, we know that the universe is, is, is likely to be pretty flat. It, we, it, we observe space to be as close to flat as we can imagine. So it seems likely, it's not inconceivable, the universe goes on forever. Now, if that's the case, in the infinite universe, anything, no matter how low the probability, will happen an infinite number of times. And if we go out far enough, there will be a region of space where there's another auditorium with people just like this, with someone like me giving a speech much like this, maybe a better one. <laughs> but, but, but that's happening, hopefully. Um, now, we're restricted because of the age of our universe to only see a certain amount of the cosmic horizon, and that limits us. And, and all these crazy things happen well beyond our cosmic horizon. But if the universe is truly infinite, we expect that they happen. So let's rate that on my scale. So we have a scale here, what's the impact? Well, you know, that's kind of amazing stuff. So I put it on the earth-shattering level. And the chance of being true, well, it's actually, an infinite universe is actually um, a consequence of many of the standard cosmologies. So there's a decent chance that it'll actually be true. Let's look at another theory. Um, this one's uh, called eternal inflation. Now, inflation is a theory that's reasonably well supported by um, the observations of our current universe. And that's a theory that says the early universe underwent this rapid period, period of acceleration, where it expanded by enormous factors. Now, if you look, about, look at what might cause that, it turns out that the fields that would generate this inflation, we did actually expect to be generating universes all the time. So we'd actually expect many of these separate pocket universes to be being uh, created constantly. So what kind of impact does that have? Well, it's certainly earth shattering that there are all these uh, extra multi, multiverse with many universes. But is it true? Well, you know, 
I mean, it seems kind of crazy, right? Um, let's look at uh, another. This is really a principle, or sort of a more than a theory, but the anthropic principle. And that says that if we look at you know where we are in the universe, we live in this very special place. They showed you that nice beach. Now, why is it special? Well, for one thing, we have to live in a special place because we exist. Right? So it's basically a truism. It says that the universe has to be such that it can allow life. Otherwise, we're not going to be created. We're not going to evolve. We're not going to be able to ask questions about the universe. So let's read that. Now, you know, it's basically, it's obviously true, right? So we'll sort of give it a light scale on the impact. But, but you know, it's almost true by definition. Now, if we combine these two theories, there's sort of a synergistic effect. Because what happens is, when the anthropic principles combined with this multiverse, what we realize is that these universes that are created can be created with many different parameters, num different number of physical dimensions, different co uh, physical constants. But we can explain a lot of these numbers that we couldn't explain before, because it's only in the universe where life can evolve that life will evolve. So. You know, I had a little fun with the unicorn and all that. But on a serious note, we are at a point where science is at the verge of making some profound discoveries, profound that, that affect basically our way we think about the universe, the fundamental nature of existence. And your job is to pay attention. Thank you.